the spirit of the living God within us, the outro, the vessel of our being, you pour forth your wisdom with clarity. With a thank you for we have wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of that spirit that you've so richly given to us in redemption. Father, our hearts are full of gratitude and praise. We do believe and receive that the burden of ignorance is dematerialized to your glory. And everybody says, Amen. Amen, amen. Well, uh, you want to turn with me uh, to a slightly different uh, uh, portion of scripture tonight. Okay, a slightly different uh, portion of uh, scripture tonight. Uh, we, we will be starting an additional strand of conversations uh, this evening. And I trust that uh, you will be richly blessed by the word of God. Hallelujah. Yeah, richly blessed by God's word. So you want to turn with me to First Timothy. Uh, you want to turn with me to First Timothy and chapter four. First Timothy and chapter four. Are you there? So First Timothy and chapter four, and I'm going to read from verse one. It says, "Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith." Given heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from mates which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. I want you to pay close attention. Uh, to that uh, uh, First Timothy 4 again. It says, it's, it's speaking about that which the Spirit uh, of God revealed to Paul supernaturally. So it says, now the Spirit speaks expressly. So we understand that uh, we have the written word of God. We have those things that have been written by the prophets. So we have the writings of Moses, yeah, and the prophets and the Psalms. And then in the writings of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, we have those things concerning Christ and uh, it's able to make us wise unto salvation, yeah, as it's crossed. And then you see that the Spirit of God uh, will reveal to the church things that ought to be corrected uh, for, for time. Now, in this case, uh, the Spirit spoke to Paul. Yeah, now the Spirit speaking expressly. Now, we don't know if this was a vision or if this was a tongue and interpretation, however it was, if it was an impression or something, but however it was, Paul knew uh, certain things that the Spirit of God wanted him to know uh, concerning the times in which the people lived. So it says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. So notice, they shall depart from the faith. That's gross, that is really bad. It says, given heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. Okay, I want you to notice that seducing spirits and doctrines of devils has a lot to do with people speaking lies in hypocrisy. And you know, remember the the Greek word for hypocrisy actually implies uh, saying one thing and doing another, or stage acting. So speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience shared with a hot iron. Verse three, forbidding to marry. Okay, now pay close attention to that. Uh, 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 forbidding people from marrying is a doctrine of devils. It is uh, a product of seducing spirits. What is it seducing uh, the saints away from? It is seducing men away from the plain truth of the gospel. Yeah, uh, from the plain truth of uh, uh, of the gospel. Uh, very, very important that... Uh, <clears throat> the, I, I want you to pay close attention to that, that men can be seduced away from what the word of God says plainly. And that seduction uh, it includes forbidding men to marry. Look at that, forbidding men to marry. Now, there's something interesting. In the word of God, marriage is not commanded. That's quite interesting. Marriage is not commanded, neither should we forbid men to marry. Right, marriage is not commanded, but we don't forbid men to marry. When we begin to get into the realms of forbidding men to marry or commanding men to marry, we are entering into an area where we ought to leave people instead to make up their minds. 
In other words, marriage is not a command of God. Neither is the forbidden to marry. So uh, whether a man marries or a woman marries, so whether a saint marries or, the, or does not marry is up to that saint. So marriage is not a gift in redemption. Yeah, marriage is not a status in salvation. Marriage it belongs to all human beings if they meet the criteria. Uh, but saints also, because they're human, can marry. Now, but it's very important that we understand that we don't forbid people to marry. Now, I want to see something about marriage because the, the word of God is quite interesting when it comes to marriage. Look at Isaiah and chapter 54. Isaiah and chapter 54. Quickly with me. Isaiah 54. <clears throat> Isaiah and chapter 54. And I'm going to read verse 5. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 5. Look at what it says. It says, uh, for your maker is your husband, your maker. So God uh, is the husband of man. What man? For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Your redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. Yeah, it says, for the Lord has called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. So in other words, notice, thy redeemer in verse 5 is called your husband in verse 5. In other words, redemption or the salvation, God's salvation of men is likened to yeah, marriage or really is marriage. Yeah, there is a marriage that is commanded in scripture and is the marriage, right, that God extends to the man that believes in which God, the husband, the redeemer is the husband and the human being that believes is the uh, wife. It's a marriage. Look at, uh, look at Isaiah, uh, Ephesians, Ephesians and chapter five, Ephesians and chapter five. Uh, Ephesians 5, and you go all the way down to verse uh, 20, uh, 29. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, 29, it says, For no man ever yet ate his own flesh, but nourish it and cherish it, it even as the Lord the church. For we are, look at that verse 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. What are we? We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. One more time. We are members of Christ's body, Christ's flesh, and Christ's bones. Now, it then says in verse 31, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Verse 32 says, this is a great mystery. I speak concerning Christ and the church. Look at verse 31 again. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. Remember, in Isaiah and chapter 54, it says that your, uh, your maker is your husband. Then it calls that salvation is a marriage in itself or salvation is the marriage of scripture it says in verse 32 of ephesians 5 this is a great mystery i speak concerning christ and the church so the man that is living his father is christ and uh, the wife that is joining himself onto is the church and the two then become one flesh now, uh, 1 Corinthians and chapter 6 and verse 17 says, But he that is, if I look at verse 16, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an allot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. What is he quoting? He's quoting Genesis and chapter 2, verse 24. Look at it quickly. He's quoting Genesis 2, 24. The two, saith he, shall be one flesh. That's where he saith he. Look at verse 24. Therefore shall a man 
leave his father and his mother. This is the same thing in Ephesians 5 and verse 31, or 30 and 31. Therefore shall the man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. They shall be one flesh. They shall be one flesh. Who are the they that are one flesh? Go back to 1 Corinthians and the chapter 6. In 1 Corinthians and chapter 6, uh, you go to uh, verse 16, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. So he's now taking that proof that Moses wrote. And in verse 17, he now says, But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So when the other party is the Lord, the joining is not in the flesh, the joining is in the spirit. Or let's put it better, the two shall be one flesh. That flesh is a figure of speech for the spirit. So a man that believes the gospel, by believing the gospel, becomes joined unto the Lord as one spirit, right? It says, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Go back to uh, that Ephesians. Ephesians and chapter 5, and I'm going to read verse 30 again. It says, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. That's the same Genesis 2.24 we just read now. Leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too, they too, they too shall be one flesh. Shall be one, who are the two? Verse 32, this is a great mystery I speak concerning Christ and the church. So Christ and the church become one flesh. What is that one flesh? First Corinthians 6 calls it one spirit. So the one flesh of the marriage of the believer and Christ is that one spirit. So the spirit of God in us is, is marriage to us yeah, in redemption. So God getting mar God's redemption of supplying his spirit to us is God making himself the husband of the man that believes. And God is that husband that never, ever, ever, ever departs. Look at Matthew and chapter 19. Matthew. Matthew and chapter 19. See what he says there. Matthew 19. Uh, it says in verse 3, the Pharisees also came unto Jesus, tempting him and saying unto him, I want you to notice that, who were those that tempted Jesus? The Pharisees, men. Now, you know that one of the names of a devil is that he's a tempter. Now, but how does the devil tempt? The devil tempts in the temptation of men. You do not find the devil's activity in any man's life independent of the human beings that that person interacts with. So, did Jesus get tempted? Yes. Who tempted him? The Pharisees. Look at it. Matthew 19, 3. The Pharisees also came to him, and tempting him. So, who were though? How did he get tempted? The Pharisees came to him. Now, all the and in that place, look at Luke and chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, the Bible says here, uh, it says in verse 1, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Now, who was he tempted by? The devil. How does the devil tempt? Now, go back to that Matthew 19. How does the devil tempt? The devil tempts in the men that we come in contact with. So the Pharisees, in Matthew 19, 3, Matthew 19, 3, the Pharisees also came to him, tempting him and saying. So when you hear that the tempter said to a person, he's talking about our interaction with the people that we trust. So the Pharisees also came to him, tempting him and saying, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, man, wife, every cause. And Jesus, verse 4, answered and said to them, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning, that is in Genesis, which we just read now, Genesis 2.24, for this cause shall the man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. So it says, he that he answered them, and he answered and said unto them, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? He made them male and female. Don't forget, who is the male? The man. Who is the man? Christ. Who is the female? The female is the human being that believes. So the male and female in the beginning, the two becoming one flesh, refers to Christ and the church. Paul explains it. It is Christ and the church. So Jesus is answering the question about Christ and the church in order for them to understand their relationships with their wives. So he says in verse 5, And said for this cause shall the man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the twin shall be one flesh. Again, quoting Genesis 2.24. So we see that Genesis 2.24 was written by Moses, then was also quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, and also explained by Paul in Ephesians 5.
And in the explanation, we see that the man is Christ and we see that the woman is humanity. So the man that believes the gospel is the woman of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is the husband of that woman. Now, so that means the marriage there is a figurative language, uh, marriage. That marriage is figurative. It's not a literal marriage. It's not that Jesus takes somebody to the court. No, there is a wedding, a union, a marriage, right? There is, uh, there is a togetherness, a one flesh, a being one flesh, which is being one spirit that is explaining to us the intimacy that we have in Christ Jesus. Go back to Hebrews very quickly. We're going to come to this, uh, uh, Matthew 19. Uh, Hebrews and chapter, Hebrews and chapter 13. Hebrews 13 and verse 1, it says, let brotherly love continue. What's brotherly love? The love by which Christ loved us and gave himself for us. Then go all the way down to verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all. What marriage? That would be the marriage called brotherly love. So that is the marriage by which Jesus joins himself to the man that believes. For the two saith he shall be one flesh. So that brotherly love, also now called marriage, so it now says verse 4, marriage is honorable in all and the bed on the fault. Okay, so the intimacy that belongs in our marriage union with God is uh, in, intact. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Who is the whoremonger? Somebody that has an intimacy outside of the intimacy that God has established in Christ Jesus. In other words, when Christ is not enough for a man, when Christ has, when the love of God is not satisfactory enough for a man, then in the love, in the marriage called salvation, that kind of, uh, when the man is in that kind of situation, we say the man or woman is a whoremonger or adulterer, and it says God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness. So in other words, the marriage that is honorable in all is be without covetousness. So there is no covetousness in our union with God. So Covetousness is not a gift given in the marriage that we have in, with Christ in, through the gospel. So when the gospel is preached to a person, that the man agreeing to the gospel is like a man responding to a marriage proposal. The marriage proposal is from Jesus Christ, who is the Redeemer, and it is proposed to the man who is listening to the gospel. And when the man believes, then the marriage union is sealed, in which Christ is the head and the man that believes is the wife. Glory to God. Now, so whether the person be male or female, the fact is that there is a marriage union in which uh, the, Jesus, as the Redeemer, makes himself available to the believer forever. Hallelujah. It says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. So our marriage to Jesus abides perpetually and forever and can never be defiled. It says the marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. And then say, what does it mean is honorable in all? Verse 5, let your conversation be without covetousness. That means there is no covetousness in that marriage that we have in Christ Jesus. That is the, there is no covetousness in salvation. And be content with such as you are. What do you have? The marriage that is honorable in all. That's what we have. We have the salvation, the redemption, that, uh, 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 which are the things that we have. For he has said, I will never leave thee. So what do we have? He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Where is he? Indwelling us by his spirit. So there is a marriage. That marriage between Christ and the church, it is enduring. It is permanent because he has said he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. That is the basis of contentment. So every man, every man, whether male or female, every man that comes to believe the gospel has entered by that marriage or by belief into a marriage. That marriage is the contentment of the indwelling of God by his spirit. He says, and be content with such, as, uh, such things as you have. What do we have? That fact, he will never leave us and he will never ever forsake us. Now, that's important uh, in starting. So like we said, the, the, the marriage that uh, there is the marriage in the Bible, Isaiah calls it that your husband is your redeemer or your maker is your husband and that husband is a redeemer. So the Lord Jesus Christ as our redeemer, our maker or the maker of the new creation by that redemption has wedded himself to us permanently. We are permanently wedded to Jesus. Hallelujah. We are permanently wedded to Jesus by the resurrection from the dead, which we believe. So we are one spirit with him. That is the marriage that has no end. That is the marriage based on the faithfulness of God. 
Hallelujah. That is the marriage that the Bible concerns itself with. We must get that. Now, go all the way down to 1 Corinthians and chapter 7. 1 Corinthians and chapter 7. Look at what it says. 1 Corinthians and chapter 7. Go all the way down to verse 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as our husband leave it. You could say that the husband is bound by the law as long as his wife leave it. But if her husband be dead, if her husband be dead, or it means if the woman's or uh, if the man's wife be dead too. So if her husband be dead, that means she is now to be treated as a single, or he is now to be treated as a single. Watch again. See, the wife is bound by the law as long as the husband lives. That means the marriage covenant, yeah, of two marriage people lasts until one of them dies. One more time. The marriage covenant between two married people lasts uh, last until one of them dies. And once one of them dies, the binding is over. So it says the woman is bound by the law. You know, some people say things like, well, is there going to be uh, marriage in the world to come? The Bible says the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband leave it. So uh, at the point that the spouse ceases to be, at the point that the spouse dies, that marriage bind or marriage bound or marriage uh, covenant or marriage uh, 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 coming together is real, a, a, man, a man or woman is released from that binding. The wife, 1 Corinthians 7, 39, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband leave it, which means that if the husband were to die, then the binding to the marriage law is dead. The same way too, the husband is bound by the law as long as his wife leave it. That means as long as the wife dies, the marriage uh, union between them is dead. Yeah, but if a husband, uh, uh, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty. Can you see that? So if her husband be dead, that means at that point, we can now treat that Christian like a non-married person. She is at liberty. What is the liberty there? Opposite of bound. Look at verse 39. The wife is bound. Then what happened to her? She is at liberty. Well, what is it that liberated her? She was liberated from the bind of marriage by the passage or the death of the, of the, of the husband or the wife. So now the Bible says she, the, speaking of the woman, is at liberty. She's no longer a wife. See, before the wife is bound. And then once her husband be dead, you now just refer to her as a she, right? She is at liberty. She's no longer married to him. They're no longer married. So the marriage union lasts until at least one of the parties is dead. At that point, there is a loosening from the binding, which is here referred to like a bondage of the marriage covenant. So it says she, 1 Corinthians 7, 39, she is at liberty. She is at what? She is at liberty. First Corinthians and chapter 7 and verse 39. What happens to her once the uh, spouse is dead? She is at liberty, right? That's a very big word. She is at liberty. That means she's no longer bound. Yeah, she's no longer bound or connected or constrained by the marriage covenant entered into. Yes, because why? She's bound only as, a, as long as the spouse is alive. So the Bible says uh, that um, uh, uh, she's at liberty. Yeah, she's at what? Liberty. That word liberty there means uh, uh, there, uh, there is no more a restraint. There is no more obligation. She is then free from a yoke. Right? That means she's free from it. She's loosed from uh, uh, what she has bound herself to. Yeah, so that means that when one marries, we are binding ourselves to our spouse, yeah, under certain conditions. And when or if the spouse be dead, then that person is at liberty. That means that person is now exempt from the former binding, or that person is not restrained, or that person is not bound, that person is actually free, right? So she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. So in other words, Marriage for the Christian is a function of the Christian's will. 
she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Whose will is important there? Whom she will, a human will. She is at, at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. So the Lord's constraint is that, that the, the, a believer's spouse should be a believer right a saint should marry a saint but then apart from uh, that's uh, the the other person being a saint the choice of which saint is up to the believer now that it is a saint not a choice it is commanded uh, which particular saint not commanded so there is no particular christian that you are to marry there is no particular person that it has been written in the stars or written in the books or written in the documents that this is the person that God has destined for you, written in the stars, in a stone, in a tablet, in a book, in a parchment, or in some document mysterious, that that is the person you must marry. Because think about it carefully. What if that person actually gets into some uh, silly behavior before you marry and they die? Does that then mean that you are now in trouble? No. Instead, the Bible says you are at liberty in the Lord. So the constraint is the person that a believer wants to marry needs to be a believer in the Lord, in the Lord. Now, once we take in the Lord out of the way, then which particular person in the Lord is up to the saint? So it says here in verse 39, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. So is there a will involved in marriage? Yes. Whose will? The will of a saint. The will of the person that wants to get married. See, notice, it's a liberty. It's a choice. It is a freedom that is given unto uh, the believer. It is not a command. Right? There, is there a command involved in marriage? Yes. It is who to marry. What, what is the who to marry? The person needs to be a saint. But there is no command about a specific person to marry, or there's no command about the status of marriage. So the believer is not commanded to marry. The believer only has a condition that if the believer were to marry, then the, then, then the partner of the believer needs to be a believer too. Yeah? But whose choice is at play? Not God's choice, uh, or, or let's put it really, the choice of God, on who to marry has been given to you for you to exercise. First Corinthians 7.39, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Let me say that one more time. It means there is no particular sister, there is no particular brother, there is no particular saint that has been written in the stars, destined in the stars, written in the skies, uh, written in your heart that says that if you don't marry that person, you are done for. No. So the believer is at liberty to be married to whom she or whom he will, only in the Lord. Now, notice something very funny here. Uh, one of the most important things is that that statement from Paul gives to the believer a liberty. A Christian woman is given a liberty that was unusual in the day of Paul. Because normally, you will have that it is the man that comes to marry the woman. But here Paul says she is at liberty. She is at liberty. She is at liberty. No, notice that the, the, the Christian woman that is not married uh, is not substandard. She is at liberty. She is at liberty to be married to whom she will, whom she will, whom she will. In other words, you need to be conscious of whom you will. Only that whom you will is within a particular will. What will? The will of the Lord. What is the will of the Lord? It is that, that the person to marry must be in the Lord. That's all. That means the person must be a saint. The person must be a believer. But I want you to see that it is a choice. First Corinthians 7, go all the way to verse, uh, uh, to verse, um, uh, verse 7. For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man as his proper gift of God, one after his manner and another after that. In other words, we are the choice. You have a choice to be married or you have a choice to be unmarried. Look at it. He said, I would that all men were even as I. That means that being married is not a command. It is equally okay for a Christian to choose not to marry as it is okay for the Christian to choose to marry. A Christian who has married has not done wrong. And a Christian who has not married has not done wrong also. Amen. Yeah, this is very, very important uh, because we need to realize that we have been given the choice. Yeah, we have been given the choice. We have been given. So the believer has a choice in marriage. 
But the believer does not, uh, uh, is not the one that determines whether to marry a, a, a believer or unbeliever. When it comes to marriage, God has the overall say, as in make sure it is a believer. You see all those things in, when you read the Bible from Genesis to Malachi that talk about don't marry that tribe, don't marry that tribe, don't marry this country, don't marry that nation. It actually has little to do with the nation, has a whole lot more to do with the belief system. You see, why they were told not to marry certain countries was because those countries were given to idolatry. So, uh, so in other words, it is still that same concept that you should not be unequally yoked to an unbeliever. It is not that God hates that one a person from one country should uh, from marrying a person from another country. No, 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 no. Instead, what it means is that country or nationality is by belief system. So uh, all those that believe Jesus, they are of the same country. All those that do not believe Jesus, they are, of, they are not of that same country. They are of another country. So there is the certain countries should not marry certain countries, which really means that the believer should not marry the unbeliever. Instead, the believer is at liberty to marry whosoever she will, only in the Lord. Amen. Only in the Lord. That's very, very important. Amen. That's very, very important because uh, not understanding that uh, people get themselves into all manner of trouble. Look at that. Yeah. So uh, 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 that, that is, look at 1 Corinthians 7 verse 38. So then he that giveth her in marriage, do it well. That means it's okay to marry. But he that giveth her not in marriage, do it better. That means it's also okay not to marry. But neither of them is a command. There is no command to say, don't marry. It is just, you have a choice to marry, not to marry. And each of them have their own, have their own, what is good or not good about them. Amen. As I see, I ask a lot about what is good and what is not, uh, not good about them. Look at, look at the verse 37. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity. Okay. So there are times when you have a necessity. That is, you are drawn to people of, a, of the opposite gender and you find that they are Christian sisters that you are attracted to they, and then you almost get to the point of, I could not do without, that is a necessity. At that point, you don't lie to yourself and say, but I think that, uh, well, since marriage is not a command, I'm choosing not to marry. And yet you can't stop thinking about uh, sisters. Uh, no, there is a necessity that has been laid upon you by yourself. So it says here in verse 37, nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will. Can you see? Has power over his own will, uh, uh, and has so decreed in his heart that he shall keep his virgin, do it well. Can you see? So if you make up your mind, and you are not pressed by any desires, and you decide, I am not going to marry, the Bible says, actually, you do well. Right, so it is. There is no command in the scriptures to marry. There is no. There is no. Ye must marry, otherwise ye are a sinner. It doesn't exist. Okay, so it's a choice. The, your power over your will is involved. If I find that I'm not exercising and controlling my appetites like I need to, if I decide, if I understand that uh, looking at myself, I am getting more and more carried away in the presence of uh, this girl or uh, uh, that sister, then I understand that, oh, at that point, necessity is beginning to crawl up on me. Now, so, but the Bible says, look at verse 36, and if any man think that he behaved himself uncomely towards his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age and needs so require, let him do what he will. Look at that. Let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. So look, look at it again. A believer can, is to do what he will in marriage. A believer is to do what he will in marrying a sister. That's what I mean. It, it, so a Christian, brother, is to do what he will in arriving at marrying a sister. Now, the, the believer is not to do what he will in marrying an unbeliever. No, that is not, that is not under consideration. Yeah, do you understand? It's not under consideration. It says, uh, if you require, if you want, if it's your choice, verse 36, let him do what he will. Oh, somebody says, oh God, I want you to be the one to choose my marriage partner for me. No, that's not God's job. Yeah, you are to use all the information at your disposal right? Whatever you want to call it, attraction, perception, whatever, whatever you want to call it. They want to use all that in arriving at yeah, a decision. Let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. In other words, 
if you have a Christian that is very, very slow in making up his mind or cannot arrive at making up his mind, he will not likely end up being a good marriage partner. You, the, a Christian is to do what he will. That means that one of the hallmarks of knowing that you are ready to marry is that you can be decisive. You know how to arrive at a decision and you are not somebody that dilly dallies and wavers and waffles when it comes to decision making, right? Because if a person cannot determine or come to a decision as to who they will marry or not marry, that means they will not likely end up married. So if I try to outsource the Bible uh, 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 power given to me to choose who uh, the Christian sister I will marry and I keep on dealing and dallying and shying and just doing all my shill shall and I keep on dancing around the circle, I will not get married, not because God is not making a choice, but because God's choice is that I choose. Amen. He says in 1 Corinthians 7 36, but if any man think that he behaved himself uncomely towards his virgin, if she passed the flower of her age, yeah, and need so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. Right? Let them marry. So, and then he now states it very clearly. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, now she's now as good as single. She is at liberty. Right? That, that's the power being, don't, being talked about earlier. She's at liberty to be married to whom she will. So you can see in verse 39, she, whom she will. And you can see in verse uh, 36, let him do what he will. So the, peop, the believer is told to do what he will in the Lord. So the, the only gotcha is that the person needs to be a saint, right? Or the other person needs to be a saint. Uh, but then uh, uh, once the person is a saint, the choice of who to marry is up to the Christian. First, first Corinthians 7.36, for the, for, the, for the brother, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. Let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. Let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. Or somebody says, no, I'm waiting to see a vision. I am waiting to have a trance. And when I have a trance, I will then become sure if she is the one to marry or not to marry. No, that means you are finding it difficult to make up your will. You don't see part of the readiness to marry is the readiness to know how to be in charge of your own decisions. Amen. Or uh, in charge of your own decisions. Now, very, very, very important. Look at 2 Corinthians and chapter 6. You see, we just read 1 Corinthians 7 that says in verse 39, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. You see that clause, only in the Lord, very important. Because only in the Lord will then mean, number one, the person is a Christian. Number two, the person is abiding by what has been said, said by the Lord to the saint. Let me say one more time. See, uh, the, a, a believer marries a believer, and that is the will of God. Which particular believer? Up to the saint. Yeah, marrying a believer, up to God. So God's, God's own part is a believer must marry a believer, right? If the believer wants to marry. Okay, this, that, that's the point. So we are not saying that there is a must and that you have to marry. And if you don't marry, you are sinning. No, no. If you have power over your will, right? Uh, you do well if you don't marry. And you do well if you marry, right? So it is your will, your choice. You are to take a combination of, uh, of factors. Now, that expression, only in the Lord, will mean that when I am trying to make up my mind, I exercise my liberty understanding the things written in the Lord. Number one is the person will be a Christian. Number two is what are those instructions to the believer in the Lord? Now, but look at 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6. Notice that the woman has a right and the man has a right. Or the believer who is a saint, the believer who is a saint, who is a brother, or the believer who is a saint, who is a sister, they both are Bible-given rights to marry whom they will in the Lord. Okay? So we see that for Christians, marriage is not just the choice of the man or just the choice of the woman. It's the choice of the two people concerned, and they are at liberty. There is a, there's a liberty given in Christ for the man in Christ. Should they want to marry, which means a man or woman in Christ, should they want to marry, they are at liberty to marry whom they will right in the law. Now, 2 Corinthians 6 and um, verse 14, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, right? That, that means you are, uh, you are not to have an imbalance, yeah, that is created 
by your, uh, by your keeping company with another person, in this case, an unbeliever. In other words, an unbeliever and a believer are not equal. Amen. A, 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 a believer and an unbeliever are not equal when it comes to marriage. Yeah, very important. A believer and unbeliever are not equal when it comes to marriage. Look at Matthew and chapter 11. Matthew 11. Are you there? Matthew 11. <clears throat> Glory to God. Matthew 11. <clears throat> Look at Matthew 11, and I'm going to read uh, verse 20. Let's see. Matthew and chapter 11, and I'm going to read verse 20, uh, 28. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It says, Take my yoke upon you. So that means Jesus as a yoke. Take my yoke upon you. How does a man take his yoke? How does a man take the yoke of Jesus? By coming unto him. Remember that to come to him means to believe in him. For he that comes to God must believe. So to come to him means to believe in him. So take my yoke. How do you take it? By believing. Remember, 2 Corinthians 6, there's a yoke not to take, unbeliever. But there's a yoke to take, that of Christ. So take my yoke upon you. How? Learn of me. So to take the yoke means to learn, right? To take the yoke means to learn, to be instructed by, to be a disciple of. So take my yoke upon you and learn of me, uh, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. So the learning that we have in Christ brings rest unto our souls. Verse 30, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That means the learning or the training or the instructions that we find in Christ, they lead unto the stability of our souls. Second Corinthians and chapter 6. So we see that from that Matthew, that the yoke means to learn. The yoke means the principles that you live by. So Second Corinthians 6 and verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked. That means that uh, we together with an unbeliever. So believer... Yeah, who is yoked with an unbeliever, it will be unequal. Why? The believer has taken unto him the yoke of Christ, and the unbeliever, by their unbelief, have not taken the yoke of Christ. So therefore, the, 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 the yoke will be uneven, unequal. So be not ye unequally yoked. That, why? Because by believing in Jesus, I am yoked. I've, take his, I've taken his yoke upon me, and his burden is light. Uh, but the world have not taken his yoke. So it is two Christians, it is two men, uh, uh, two human beings that are, that are under the yoke of Christ that are to come into marriage union. So you have a brother and you have a sister. The, what makes the sister sister? The sister has the yoke of Christ. What makes the brother brother? The brother has the yoke of Christ. They are both under the yoke of Christ and now they can be equally yoked. Amen. They can be equally yoked. On the other hand, it means, of course, that there are, uh, it is possible, see, in the Lord, now, I'm going to come back to it. Uh, uh, I want to come back to it. I, I want you to see that. Do not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Yeah? Now, do not be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. See, the, what is it? Go back to 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians and chapter 7. Hmm? So, uh, when I am looking at uh, uh, marrying as a Christian, should I choose to marry? Remember, remember, I, I want you to see this. Ma uh, uh, First Corinthians 7, 37. Very important. First Corinthians 7, 37. What does it say? First Corinthians 7, 37. Well, uh, it says, uh, nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, Having no necessity, but as power over his own will. That means he has made a choice. I am not going to marry. Yeah. So, and as so decreed in his heart that he keep his virgin. That means he stay unmarried. He do it well. So, the, the, there is a choice available for a Christian not to marry. Okay. Or, uh, you know, sometimes the way that we talk as believers, we, we put unnecessary burden and unnecessary pressure on one another. Your friend will say things that, like, when are you going to settle down? Have you settled down? Uh, think about it. The, the truth is, whether we like it or not, is not everybody who is going to marry. 
And in fact, there are, it's not everybody that should marry. Although we cannot forbid anybody from marrying. Right? And there will be those that made up their mind of their own accord not to marry. And if they make up their mind of their own accord, that, that is what 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 37 is saying. They have the power over their own will. That means they, they are exercising their choice and they know that they could have done it one way or the other. So they could have been like Paul unmarried or they could become married like me, for example. So, but had power over his own will and had so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, do it well. Notice, he is the one deciding. He is the one keeping. He is the one that has the power over his own will. It is not that somebody else has told him, you must not marry, you shall not marry. It's not that. At that point, it's a command. So there is no command not to marry. Yeah, but there is no command to also marry. However, there is a choice to marry or not marry. You have a choice to say, you know what? I've made up my mind that for certain reasons, I am not going to marry. At First Corinthians chapter seven verse thirty-seven. But remember, the person that does so must must continue to test himself. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity. So a person that says, "Oh, I'm not going to marry," but can see that <laughs> necessity is calling upon my emotions every now and then. That person that should not put himself or herself under trouble. So having no necessity, but has power over his own will. So there's a point at which you know that, mm, although I desire not to marry, it looks like, ah, I really am finding myself that I like somebody of the opposite gender and I like this person intensely. Then of course, that you might then no longer have power over your will to stay unattached. At that point, uh, what do you do? You are then in verse 36. At that point, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let him marry. If you can stay, not uh, if you can stay without getting into all these emotional binds and all that, then the Bible says in verse 37, it let him keep his virgin, he do it well. So they're both choices. Amen. They're both choices. But look at verse 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. So it's a choice, but it's in the Lord. It's a choice, it's in the Lord. Let me say it again. Uh, the, Christian, <laughs> the Christian does not primarily base their decision to marry on I'm in love. The Christian is to base it on decisions. Wait, you are attracted to the person all well and good, but way above and beyond uh, and on the garden the I like or I'm attracted to is the decision. Look at it again. First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 36. But if any man think, that he behaved himself uncomely towards his virgin. If she passed the flower of her age and needs so require, let him do what he will. He sinneth not, let them marry. Can you see? Yeah. So he, he, has, he has actually, in his thinking, he has made up his mind, he has thought about things, he's come to a decision, and that the answer is to marry. In other words, it will make more sense if more Christians entered into marriage by decision right? They, they, they might have been pulled initially by attraction, but then they are to sit down and begin to understand uh, the choices at their disposal, and then they make up their mind, and then they make a choice. Amen. So it is not feelings that's pushing us. I fell in love. Now, most times uh, people do the Hollywood effect, which is, why are you married to that person? I just fell in love. Now, it's more than falling in love. It has to be in the Lord. That means that in the Lord will regulate your falling in love. That means you will quickly fall out of love if, if that person is not in the Lord. Amen. So the number one thing the believer is looking for, not the only, but the number one thing is, well, my choice in the Lord to stay devoted to God. I, I, I found that with this person, I can build a life together, a believer. Or I found out that, well, you know what? In order to run my race, I'm going to stay unmarried. Either option is available. Of course, when we talk, uh, we don't actually say it this plainly. Most times we will be like, okay, you've gone to university or you, you are at a point in your life, you've graduated or you are about at the point where everybody expects you to then do the next thing. And people start asking you, you've done this, you've done that, you've done that, you've done that. Uh, when are you going to settle down? Sometimes we should not tell people that. 
Some people are as settled as they need to be in Christ. In fact, all of us are to be settled in Christ Jesus, right? And when he is the satisfaction of our lives, then we have something to share with others and to give to others. But if Jesus is not the satisfaction of your life, and you therefore do not own enough of your own emotions to share with somebody else. Why? Because you will be at the whims and caprices, or you'll be at the beck and call of emotional upheaval. Up today, down tomorrow, you you. Now, so a believer, a Christian, a saint is to be ruled by not only, not the emotions, but a decision arrived at in the Lord. I didn't say there is no emotion. I didn't say there is no attraction. Of course, there'll be attraction. Of course, there'll be emotion. But the truth is, you might discover that there's more than one person you are attracted to. Why is that the case? Human beings are human beings, right? But the decision should not be many people. It should just be one. You are at liberty to marry whomsoever you will. Yeah, it didn't say many people, right? In other words, you understand you are going into a monogamy. It's not a, uh, well, maybe I'm going to just, uh, by faith, I'm going to believe and receive uh, uh, 10 wives. You can't, you shouldn't. It's not available in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to see something there. Notice in the way that 1 Corinthians 7.39 is written, he did not mention any particular sister. He says, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband be dead, she's at liberty to be married to whom she will. Which person? We don't know. But the person is to be in the Lord. So there is no such thing as, I hereby believe and receive that that particular sister is my wife, whether she likes it or not. No, that doesn't exist. Just like you have a will, she's also, see, just like I'm at liberty to like you, you are at liberty not to like me. So you can have a Christian brother and then a sister, and then the one is attracted to the other. The, see, that is a liberty exercise. But then the, the other person has a liberty not to like. Amen. <laughs> so that there are two hearts that or two decisions that must come together. But the point is in verse 39 of 1 Corinthians 7, she is at liberty to marry to whom she will. Then we see that in uh, verse uh, 36, let him do what he will. He sinneth not. Let them marry. So he will, she will, they marry. So in, he in Christ, she in Christ, he will, uh, then she will, then they marry. Now, if he is in Christ, she is not, there's no willing. Let me say it again. If, if, either pa if there's one of the party not in Christ, that means not the Christian, right? Then there is no marriage. There might be feelings, but the feelings come, feelings go. In fact, you, you pray it away. Right now, so the fact is, as a believer, yeah, as a believer, we must understand these things, yeah, or as a believer, you must understand this fact. I, I want to see it again that the key thing when it comes to uh, marriage for a Christian, if I look at it very carefully, it says, yeah, let me, let me look at it again, look at it, first Corinthians 7, first Corinthians 7. It says here in verse 39, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband be dead, she's at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Let me give you an idea of in the Lord. So you see the point. That's 1 Corinthians 7, right? Go back to 1 Corinthians 5. So it says, 1 Corinthians 5, it says in uh, verse 1, it is, common, it is reported commonly that there's a fornication amongst you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should love his father's wife. Now, what did Paul say that should happen? Paul said in, uh, uh, in, verse, uh, in verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Uh -huh. What fornicators? Verse 11, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters. For then must you need to go out of this world. Say, but verse 11, I have written unto you not to keep company if a, any man that is called a brother be, so in, think about this carefully. So if we are not to keep company with a brother that is da, 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 then it means that a sister who sees that brother, the number one thing you would think about in the Lord is not your emotion. The number one thing you think about is, oh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11 tells, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or railer or drunkard or extortioner with such a one, no, not to eat. Firstly, okay? Now, but you know what is funny? People don't think that way. People, see, let me say it again. If you have a brother, that you have been told in the scriptures to avoid, not to keep company with, which means not to be influenced by, that kind of brother, you do not marry. 
What do you do? You, are, you and the saints around surround that brother with love and assistance and aid and fellowship until that believer grows. So the, see, let me say it again. First uh, Corinthians 5. Imagine if when Paul said in verse 11, but now I've written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be fornicator or covetous or idolater or railer or drunkard or extortioner. That means if I see the brother and the report that is said about him is that even if uh, love was like ice block on my head, that what I'm meant to do as a sister will be to first say that fellow is a brother and as a brother, we want him to grow. And because he needs to grow now, what he needs is not girl matter. And therefore, I am not going to keep company with him so that we don't get into that kind of stuff. You get the point. So why? Because otherwise, if you begin to keep fellowship with, when I say fellowship, you stay in the company of, and you become influenced by uh, a brother that you should have stayed away from, and you are so influenced, you influence each other to the altar. When the brother start acting like the man in First uh, Corinthians five eleven, then who are you? What are you going to cry foul? No, you shouldn't cry foul because the number one thing to have done is not just oh, pastor, but I love him with all my heart. Anytime I see him, my vascular bundles just jump. I melt like butter on something. You know, you get you wax lyrical with poetry. No, it's the 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 number one poetry that should govern a. And on an unmarried believer, when it comes to exercising uh, a, the power of choice, is you do it in the Lord, right? You consider that concept of yoke. What is yoke? What influences you? What you are yielded to? What you learn from? So Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. And in taking that yoke, Paul then said, I, in 1 Corinthians 5.11, now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother, B, 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 then he lists it. Now, go all the way down to first uh, or second Thessalonians and the chapter three. Look at it again. It says, verse six, now we command you, second Thessalonians chapter three, verse six. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which has received the loss. Now, that's very funny. It means then that when a saint wants to uh, begin to make themselves available to another believer for relationship, you begin to look at the epistles. Is this a person I should keep company with? Why? Because I must firstly be concerned about the welfare of my brother or my sister so that that person can grow and then we can be equally yoked together. Right? Now, that's very funny because what tends to happen is uh, somebody will say, person who I hear you, uh, you are speaking for yourself. I love him. He's a brother. He's in Christ. Uh, but Jesus does not find fault with him. And so I'm going to marry him. Just make sure that when you marry him to you, don't find fault. You understand? You will make sure that if you marry him, you don't find fault. When you start finding fault, because let me tell you, it's true that Jesus will not find fault, but you might. And when you start finding fault, you have, you are, we will have entered into a premeditated situation and put ourselves into a bind. So what do we do? We, we tell our, we tell our uh, adrenaline and we tell our hormones that is running wild to say that is a brother in the Lord. It's not just a biological specimen. It's not, or she's not just a biological specimen. She's not just getting me excited. Uh, the truth is I'm excited about him or her and that fellow is a Christian, but I am concerned about the spiritual welfare. So what am I going to do? I'm going to see that is this brother in, firstly in need of somebody to date now or in need of a disciple? Oh, somebody said, Pastor, I like that. I will be the disciple who is then going to date. Well, <laughs> the Lord help thee. I can't tell you not to, but the Lord help thee because you can spare yourself such edicts. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Thessalonians, and chapter 3, verse 6, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from, uh, uh, from every brother that walketh his orderly. You understand? In other words, they, they think to what somebody says, I am at liberty to marry whomsoever I will, yeah, in the Lord. So part of the in the Lord already tells you certain brethren to watch out for. Why? Not because we hate them, but because we want them to grow. Because in their growth, we are then able to practice the life of Christ together. Amen. Right? Now, 
Look, I want you to see this. That they see two believers that want to get into the marriage uh, commitment are, are believers that are meant to be equally yoked. Let me say it again. Just because a person is a believer does not mean you and that believer are equally yoked. They, see, the yoke simply refers to the learning and the influences that the other that the believer is subjected to, and there are certain believers that are just not subjected to the right influences. You want to ask yourself: Is this an equal yoke? Although your emotions may say, "Wow, wow, 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 wow," this is a brother. Oh, uh, this is a heavenly body. Whatever the case you want to call it. <laughs> but the first thing you want to do to yourself is, well. I know it's a brother. I'm going to wait a little and make sure that this fellow can grow and is growing and developing and is submitted to saints in the church. Why? Because when and if you marry, if there were to be challenges between you two, you would then wish that that person is committed to the word of God. Amen. Okay. So it's very, very important. It's very, very important. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. We're, so we're looking at, at liberty to be married to whomsoever she wills in the law. First Corinthians 15, and go all the way to verse 32 or 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So, for, but some man will say, how are the dead raised? So in other words, Paul is saying that, hey, what is the evil communication now? What people say to one another. Look at verse 35. But some man will say. Yeah? Then in verse 36, it says, thou fool. Right? So in other words, there are certain people that will then say certain things. What are they talking about? They are talking about the, the resurrection of the body. Look at it. It says, uh, so in other words, evil communication will be those things said contrary to what the Bible has taught about the resurrection. In other words, when people speak contrary to sound doctrine, their evil communication will corrupt your good manners in sound doctrine. It's possible. So a believer can influence another believer against God's word, against sound doctrine, against sound health, against common sense. So the Bible says, be not deceived. Evil communications. What's evil communications? What we say that deceives the other person. Now, what did they say? Yeah. What, what did they say that was deceiving one another? I want to see it. Yeah. Uh, what did they say? Uh, uh, look at verse 16. For if the dead rise not. That's what they were saying. Yeah, verse 17, if Christ be not raised. Verse 13, if there be no resurrection. Verse 14, if Christ be not risen. Can you see? Now, verse 12, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, I'll say, that's communication, I'll say, some of you, that there is no resurrection of the dead. That will be the evil communication. What is it corrupting? It's corrupting the good manners, which is the sound doctrine that understands the reality of the word of God. In other words, uh, uh, these, in other words, they are the people that you expose yourself to, that you are attracted to, that you are influenced by, definitely that you find yourself uh, in quote falling in love with, can corrupt your good manners in sound doctrine. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians and chapter 15, verse 33, it says, be not deceived, Evil communications corrupt good manners. So in other words, I am going to watch out for this person that I want to marry. The person might not be a PhD Bible, might not be a PhD sound doctrine, but this person has a heart to learn the truth, has a heart to receive the truth, has a heart to be influenced by the truth. But what if I meet somebody who is having evil communications? That means a heart set against the truth of the gospel. Ah, somebody says, look, he's born again. He might not, he might not uh, agree with uh, discipleship. He might not agree with speaking in tongues. He might not agree with flowing in the spirit. He might not agree with Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. He might not agree with sound doctrine. He might not agree with the coming together of the saints. He might not agree with the effect of the local assembly. He might not agree on the, the uh, understanding the leading of the spirit. He might not agree with the love work. But he's a Christian. I, I like him. Uh, if a person <laughs> does not agree on all those things I just listed, Slow down. 
Slow down. He said, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Because after a while, what you expose your heart to over a period, you find yourself, start, you start getting to understand. You start getting to uh, say, I get it. Eh, it's not that difficult. The fellow is saying, eh, speaking in tongues is not that a big deal. And you say, eh, really, it's not. What matters is to be born again? Ha. Huh? So in First Corinthians 15, 33, be not deceived. Evil communications. So those kind of things they were saying earlier, that's the evil communication. Yeah, they were saying in verse 20, but now is Christ risen from the dead and is the, uh, let's say, you know, but they, they were saying, they, they were saying all manner of interesting things about what, look at verse 12, sorry. If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, that is good, that, that's what it means by uh, uh, good manners. The good manners there is Christ has been preached that he rose from the dead. So that is good manners. Now, I'll say some of uh, you uh, among you that there is no resurrection of the dead. That is evil communication. So that speech that there is no resurrection of the dead could corrupt your good manners until you get to a point where you begin to doubt the things you once trusted in. So in other words, in getting to find out the believers I'm going to get along with as an unmarried Christian, don't forget, there is no command that says you must marry. Or, and on the other hand, there is no command that also says you must not marry. It's a thing of choice. You have the power of choice. First Corinthians 7, 37. First Corinthians 7, 36. First Corinthians 7, 38. First Corinthians 7, 39. You, the woman is at liberty. The sister is at liberty to marry whom she will. And then in 36, the believer, the brother, is at liberty. Or, uh, 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 if he marries and makes up his will, is correct also. So both the sister and the brother have the power to get into a relationship that ends up in the marriage. But we are saying that in the steps that lead up to marriage, Right in the step a little of the marriage, you don't only want to say, "Okay, uh, uh, well, is he an unbeliever?" By all means, if the person is not a Christian, red flag. No, no. But what if the person is even a Christian? We're not saying it's not just a know that the person be a Christian. Be sure that the person's evil communication, if he has, will not corrupt your good manners. And if the person's evil communication will corrupt your good manners, you actually will not keep company. You stay away. You stay away from walking in a, a kind of close, closeness with that person to so they influence you against common sense in the gospel. So when I see a brother or a sister, if I was not married, and I see a brother or sister who is not sound in the gospel or who is in evil communication against the gospel, the first thing I pay attention to is not, ah, and the guy is fine, oh, ah, oh, and the girl is, uh, oh, my, 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 my. I saw you and, and tongue started flowing out of me, right? You, 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 while the tongue is flowing out, you pause and you tell yourself, this evil communication, I must not allow to corrupt my good manners. Firstly, this brother or this sister is a candidate for discipleship. The truth is, you know what is funny? There will be other brothers and sisters around you that will grab that fellow or grab that sister and quickly say, ah, well, uh, if that brother is not saying yes and they're still waiting for you to grow, me, you don't need to grow. You don't need to speak in tongues. You don't need to dance in the spirit. You don't need to laugh in the spirit. You don't need to do tongues and habitation. You don't need to study God's word. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead for your, for your sin? Uh, yeah, for your salvation? Yes, I believe it. Do you agree that your sins are forgiven? Yes, yeah, good. That's enough for me. So we are married. No, because there will be a time when you both need to actually uh, rely on your understanding of the word of God, it cannot be microwaved. Amen. It cannot be microwaved. So in other words, uh, spiritual growth or spiritual development is a factor too. It's not everything. The, the, the biggie is the person must be in Christ. Fine. But then in Christ also, you then have believers you are told not to come company with. So I'm not saying that everybody you want to marry must be an apostle Paul or, or Peter. Anyway, if it was a Paul, he wouldn't even marry you, right? But I'm saying that uh, we need to understand our own limits. The fact that we are available or liable to be influenced by those that we interact with on a day-by-day -day basis. So you want to open your eyes to say, well, this brother or sister, I'm comfortable that if this person influences my life for the future, in the general direction of the influence to be good. Okay, you're in safe hands. If the general direction would be yo-yo, up to the down tomorrow, you're in trouble. Yeah, or if you are the kind of person that will submit other people to a yo-yo life, you also should spare them the problem by actually growing up somewhat yourself. Now, I'm, I, 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 which of us is not growing up spiritually? We are still growing up. 
Every one of us continues to grow because in our mind, we need to understand more and more finely and be influenced more, uh, more thoroughly by the fruit of the gospel. So all of us are growing, but there is a level of growth that will ensure that you are not unequally yoked. There are certain people that will be an unequal yoke for you, and if they are an equal yoke for you, then you will not be able to practice the word of God together. Amen. And we should be able to practice the word of God together. Glory. Look at 1 Corinthians 7 before we go. 1 Corinthians and chapter 7, quickly. 1 Corinthians 7. We'll go back all the way to verse 15. The Bible says, If the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God has called us to peace. What did God call us to? To peace. Now, so God did not call us to be unmarried. He did not call us to be married. He called us to peace. So what am I going to watch out for in my choices as an unmarried Christian or as a married Christian anyway? It is the peace of God. God has called us to peace. God has called us to peace. God has called us to peace. Very important. God has called us to peace. Now, look at this again. Yeah, that a Christian yeah, is at liberty. First Corinthians 7, I'm going to go to 36 before we close. 36 says, but if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely towards his virgin, that means towards the unmarried person that is dating, if she pass the flower of her age and it so require, let him do what he will. Let him do what he will. So that means the, the, the permission has been given by God for the believer, the brother, to do what he will in marrying the sister. He sinneth not. Let them marry. Whose will is it? The brother's will. Somebody says, no, I don't want my will. I want God to choose for me. No. The Bible says, let him do what he will. Let him do what he will. So I stay sensitive to the promptings and the leadings and the perceptions in my heart, but it is finally my choice. It's my choice, finally. Let him do what you will. Let him do what you will. Let him do what you will. He sinneth not. Let them marry. Then you go all the way to verse 37. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, do it well. That means it is as good not to marry as it is to marry. That was Paul. It, it, there's no case of, you know what? If you don't marry, you are not settled. You are still unsettled. When will you settle down? You see, we use those words or those kind of terminologies to rush people into emergency uh, uh, decisions when it comes to marriage where they have abandoned the word of God and the reality of fellowship with the saints. Let me say it again. A believer that does not know how to stay in fellowship with the other brethren, and you think that believer likes you uniquely, before long you discover that whatever is making that believer not to be able to get along with every other believer will also manifest in your likelihood not to be able to get along with one another. So what do I do as a Christian, a smart Christian in the Lord? I begin to watch that brother's walk or that sister's walk or slant or attitude or perspective towards the saints, towards the brethren. But a fellow or, or girl that fights all the brethren in her life or fights or he fights all the sisters in his life and none of them is ever good enough and then says, but you, you are good. You, it's likely to lead to problem later. At the point when he's telling you that all of them are failures, only you are good enough, your head may swell. But the day is going to come when even you might not be good enough. So, but what are you going to do? You are going to make sure that this is a brother or this is a sister that knows how to get along with other saints, knows how to forbear, knows how to work in the love of God, knows how to consider the brotherhood or knows how to consider the saints. Hallelujah. Now, and that kind of brother or that kind of sister, it, it gives you a foundation for a yoke that can be equal. Hallelujah. That means for a learning, a persuasion that can be equal because you are both learning from the love of God. Well, guys, uh, uh, that was our introduction today. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit more in the days to come about the marriage union or the unmarried state. Yeah, so uh, don't forget, guys, we meet tomorrow at 8 in the morning. And until we see, guys, uh, don't forget, God has not called us unto bondage. He's called us unto peace. Good night.